don't you get aggravated at these Oh, no, like- I actually, um, there was, I was on Tumblr and somebody reblogged. It's like, there's a petition. We're going to start a petition to get Sony to give it back. And uh, like my anger boiled over at that point because I don't engage with that kind of stuff most of the time. I you just, just can't. Yeah. But that was the one I was like, okay, fuck this. I'm just like, there are actual fucking issues and you're really going to spend your effort trying to get a trademark back to a multi-billion dollar conglomerate because you like one actor slightly better than the other. Oh my God, get over yourself. But I haven't gotten hate mail on Tumblr that quickly in so long. It was so Are wonderful. you serious? Yeah. Do you want me to read it out for you? Oh my God. People are so fucking oblivious. I, and you know what, Max? I, this is just becomes like a war because I can't, I can't stop myself because I know I'm a stupid asshole who does this and I can't stop getting mad. But I just want to argue with these people. Like, I just want to beat them down, you know? Because Oh, my God. I forgot how long it was. Hey there. I just wanted to let you know that I am completely aware that there are actual fucking problems in the world. I am also an activist for global warming, LGBTQ+, women's rights, disabled rights, the blind, the deaf, and many more. And oh. I agree need to be dealt with. I have a separate Tumblr for all of this, just in case you were wondering. I am not wasting my energy, nor am I yelling about this matter. In my opinion, this is something worth fighting for at this moment, just among many other things. And it's not just me. As of right now, this matter is trending on Twitter, Tumblr, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, you name it. I respectfully believe that you are wasting your energy spreading hate and that you would be very exhausted if you were to give rude comments to all the people. Instead, I encourage you to spread kindness. I hope you have a great day or night. (laughs) (laughs) The ending. (laughs) I hope you have a great day or night. Well, you know what, Max? This person sounds... Uh, I could tell they were stalking my blog later because, <laughs> because I got a notification that they liked one of my posts, which means they had just been scrolling for so long trying to find like something problematic about me, and they like forgot, forgot and they just liked <laughs> one of the posts. <laughs> oh, man. I, I didn't end up responding to that because I'm just like, hey, you, you fucked up already. Right. So. Well, I'm glad we finally got our first comment. On the Spectator Film, Film Podcast. Podcast. Uh, no, sorry. I'm sorry, everybody. That's a lie. That's not about <laughs> our show. I wish it was, kind of. <laughs> they really went out of their way to just, like, try to let you know that they're like, you know what? No, I am legit, bro. Although I am supporting a multi-billion dollar corporation that probably produces more plastic than any other fucking company on the face of the goddamn planet. So literally, you are consuming Disney because there's definitely Disney plastic inside of you, stupid fucking piece of shit. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, I'm Austin. <laughs> and I'm Fraggle. Yes. Uh, and uh, today we are not doing Spider-Man. How did we get yelling about that? Should we explain that before we move on? Oh, yeah. In the We're not this mad. Well, you're not this mad, <laughs> usually. In the contemporary uh, moment where we're recording this a couple days ago the news broke that sony got back the rights to spider-man because they wouldn't agree to disney's demands that they wanted 50 percent of all revenue for spider-man up from five percent right so people were fucking starting a hashtag petitions, yeah to and petitions to give it back to fucking disney this makes no difference whatsoever <laughs> it makes no difference you just want you did you guys did this with game of thrones Remember when everybody didn't like the final episodes so you started a petition to get a new one? Where did that get you? Fucking nowhere. And also, this is Disney. It's the five, most homogenous Five company, of the yeah. top five highest grossing movies of this year, all of them were made by Disney. You know, I don't... They don't need your fucking help. Well, here's the thing. Like, why are we cheering to get a more homogenous entertainment industry? Yeah. Like, what is wrong with you idiots? Like... And Disney already like has a fucking vice grip on everything. Like I think for the past like what five or six years at least, they've taken at least sixty percent of all box office earnings. Yeah, they don't. What need, the fuck? They don't need your grassroots fan movement. You got a grassroots against them because they're fucking Skynet. <laughs> Just wait until their streaming service is activated. Oh my god. <laughs> Um, well, Amazon's already working on something called a war cloud for the Pentagon. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm we're getting so excited it. for our future, everybody. But uh, speaking of their streaming service, I yeah. assume that the movie we're doing today will exist on their streaming service. God damn it. Or not, because Netflix apparently is doing a TV show that we had no idea existed. And it came out today. Yeah, the, the day that we're recording this, it released, which is 
the sequel series to The Dark Crystal, the yes, movie we're the doing Dark today Crystal. on the Spectator Film Podcast. And it was your pick. Yes. No, it was yeah, your pick. I was just fucking with you. I was testing you. You caught me. Uh, <laughs> uh, today, uh, we're doing my pick, Dark Crystal, as you said, and uh, I have no clue why I chose this. Apparently, the marketing worked. Apparently, I saw a Dark Crystal thing and it just was, in the Google feed or something. And you maybe didn't notice ago. it, but your brain did. Yeah, and then it planted the seed, and they incepted me, those fucking bastards, and now I am doing marketing for them by doing this episode. Yeah, but at least we're not promoting the new series. Um, you I, know what? The new series sucks. I watched it already. It's terrible. I haven't. I've heard very good things and very bad things. So, so yeah, I don't know anything about it yeah. or who's involved, but I heard that they're using puppets, so at least there's that. Uh, today, however, obviously, because this is not a TV podcast, we are talking about the 1982 movie. And uh, I guess I've been interested in doing this movie since we did Labyrinth um, at one point or another. Although, again, I'm not really sure why I chose it this week. Um, and I think it's nobody's going to go back and check. So it's one year since we did our Labyrinth episode. So we thought it would be a good follow up. Yeah, sure. Why not? Um, I think at the time during our Labyrinth episode, we both agreed that we preferred the dark crystal yeah and i had not seen it in quite a while same but definitely watching it again this week it was real like i don't want to say revelation but again it was just one of those movies where i haven't seen it in a while and then being able to watch it for the show helped me appreciate a lot of different new things about it and then also like again i i i, I think to reiterate a point we made in our labyrinth commentary i really do enjoy this one more and a lot of it has to do with like it is just focusing on creating this world. It's more novel than uh, Labyrinth, right? It doesn't have like the pretense of a story to like get to these special puppetry and effects. And I just think it's really like creative. You get more of that Jim Henson create creativity and cleverness in this. Well, yeah, to go so, yeah. off of that, um, I think this movie has some similarities with Labyrinth. Um, you have this huge mystical world that is foreign to the viewer. You have a bland and uninteresting main character and you have a bunch of side characters that you're like, why am I not focusing more on this one? And also the villains are slightly more interesting and fun than the actual main character. Yes. But dark crystal excels where labyrinth fails one. Cause I'm not staring at David Bowie's dick the entire movie. So I actually get to admire. Is that a failure? I mean, it's not in filmmaking. In my personal life, no, I enjoy it. But I don't know. But uh, that's production value. <laughs> David Bowie's dick. <laughs> that comes free at you. <laughs> it's like John Ford wanting to shoot in like Monument Valley. He's just like, ah, I want this landscape. No, oh my God, it's David Bowie's cock. But without me having to stare at David Bowie's dick for the majority of the movie, I can actually focus on the amazing puppetry and matte paintings that are in this movie. I can appreciate the artistry rather than just looking at God's artistry that lo went into making David Bowie's dick. Right. Well, they replace it with Agra's nipples that you can see through a dress. <laughs> so that seems to be what's driving you through this movie. <laughs> I just can't believe they added that. We'll get to that. So yes, I assume you also enjoy this movie more than Labyrinth after watching it again this week? Yeah, for everybody who hasn't heard our Labyrinth episode, uh, Labyrinth was an interesting thing for me because my mom always rented that movie when I was a kid, and I did not like it as a kid. Um, I didn't see Dark Crystal until a couple years later, but I remember like... I'm sorry, did she force you to watch it? So basically, <laughs> I, thought, I thought I told this before, but my mom usually would like go to Blockbuster, pick up a movie for my sister, and I put it on and then like right. leave us alone to it. She normally was very good with remembering like, oh, well, Max loves Scooby-Doo, so we're going to get that or something like that along those and lines. Sometimes it was, oh, it's a Pan's Labyrinth. It's a it's <laughs> fantasy. So, yeah, no, <laughs> she got Labyrinth for us on four separate occasions and every time insisted we had never seen the movie before. And every single time we'd be just like, no, we don't like this movie. <laughs> and But I could watch it anyway, damn it. We're her kids. Yeah. We had one hour of screen time normally during the day. So if we got to watch a movie, it was a big occasion. So it was, it was oh some, my God. If it was moving in front of us, we would watch it. Yeah. I think that's why I got into film, just to like my childhood. They, like, they artificially created the forbidden fruit yeah. situation. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I didn't see this until years later, I think I was probably like 12 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I remember, cause that's when I was 
I had just, I believe, gotten out of my, like, I'm going to try to make clay stop animation stuff. So I was starting to blossom into my love of practical effects. And I remember looking at this movie and adoring everything. I loved the puppets and whatnot, but I was slightly before the point where I realized how much work puppetry took. So I didn't appreciate it as much. And for some reason, until this podcast, I hadn't revisited it. And I think that's a travesty because I'm on rewatching it for the podcast. And I have no excuse. I own this on a double feature disc with Labyrinth. And I've watched Labyrinth more than I've watched this movie. But Well, I, I think we both know why. Yes. Um, the to, allure of 2016 David was a hard year. I needed something <laughs> to get through it. Um, but yeah, I, I do like this movie much better than Labyrinth, even having not seen it in like over a decade. Yeah. Like I remembered, I liked this better than the labyrinth and upon revisiting it, it's really not hard to see why. Yeah. It's it's not perfect, but it's not perfect, it, but it, I, I can't quite think of anything else that has the same goal in terms of we're just going to create a quote unquote live action movie that is just puppetry. You know, it's a very interesting project that I think requires, it's more demanding than labyrinth and it it results in a movie that has like a weird sensation when you're watching it in a way that you can't quite do with Labyrinth, right? Where it's like, wow, this really does change the way I'm engaging with everything. And it's not just the fact of it being physical and practical compared to like CG and what Disney is doing with The Lion King, although I'm sure we'll make that comparison at certain points during the commentary track and why one works better than the other. But it it does really change the way you're like, picking up on details and uh, the way in which you engage with like subtext and like implications in this movie. It's like, no, this movie needed to be puppets. So yeah, I, it's not, it's not like a movie that's just like, Oh, well the director or creator excels in doing this. So we're going to tell a story that doesn't really need this, but include them because that's yes, the director's exactly. strength. This movie could not exist without the director's it's very strength. Very well said because yeah. I think it's easy to neglect the uh, sort of, I guess, subtextual implications of it being all puppets because there's nothing else like it. I think it's such a novelty that it's almost hard to engage with in that way. You know, we don't really have as much of a frame of reference for that, especially with it being the type of fantasy movie that it is. And we'll talk about genre during the commentary track as well. But I think a lot of that stuff actually informs it in a way that makes it intelligent in a way that, you know, even though there, I, you know, definitely there's some scholarship on, Jim Henson's movies, I feel like maybe people might not pay attention to this one as to the same capacity that they could. Yeah, now this know? has a a very large cult following. It's a, yeah, it's a cult hit, but like this movie did well at the box office back uh, let's in the say day because there are some interesting things about that too. Yeah, about different countries it did well in. Yes, I know that. Yeah, um, but so yeah, do you think you're ready to enter the? Oh no, well not enter the dark crystal. That doesn't make I'm sense. I'm ready to snort some fraggle rock and go what? on a wild ride. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do it. Let's go. Mm. God damn it. I was going to do it to <laughs> throw you off. I knew you were going to do it. And I'm like, I'm not fucking letting him get that. I can't believe we didn't mention that during the introduction. I can. That's the most important line from this movie. No, it's not. Please. <laughs> I'm. I've, it's everyone's favorite quote. I've stolen Austin's taser that he's used to threaten me before in the past. And every time he makes that noise throughout the recording, I'm going to tase him just a little to remind him to stop. Well, the, that's the, a lie. The movie does it. But anyway, we're starting off. Yes, this in an age of wonder. I always, I don't, I mean, I know why they stopped doing it because it, you know, it doesn't look like verisimilitudinous in terms of how they make clouds with these like paint drops that they would always use on the sky, right? That's how they did this in all these movies. Um, But I always think this effect is beautiful because it looks like clouds, but it's kind of like has an aesthetic to it as well. And it's so ominous though. I mean, it works perfectly here. And I think that is, again, part of the thing we were discussing in terms of like the use of puppets in this movie and how important it is. And we're going to find a lot of instances throughout this commentary track to point out how when the entire world is is sort of inanimate objects that are animated, it 
it does this interesting thing to a concept that you know I hate and that listeners know I hate, which is world building. And it allows you to get away with certain things that uh, you're probably not going to do in, in other movies of this kind if you're not puppeteering them. Or rather, let me rephrase that. It's going to lead you to prioritize different things that you're interested in exploring in a way that is different from movies that are live action with just people. Also, we're here introduced not only to the plot and overarching backstory and narrative of the film, well, also introduced to the Skeksis, which... Skeksis, right? Yes. Sis? Skis? Skis. Oh, who cares? Yeah. Um, don't at us. But these... I, I know you have different favorite costumes, but like in puppets, but just in general, like as characters, as designs... I love them. I found out. Are they your favorite? Some of them, yeah. Um, I think some puppets are better made. I think some characters have better personalities and are more fun. Mm -hmm. But I think just overall, they 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 average out the highest for me. Mm -hmm. Also, I found out even though there's more than seven of them, originally each one was supposed to represent one of the seven, seven deadly, deadly sins. sins. Yeah, which I've read that too. But I also. It seems like the type of thing that people just say, and I'm like, but what does that mean? Well, it would make sense because there is like, they they do all exhibit that, and like I would not doubt like the general who takes control was supposed to represent wrath, the one that's gorging himself more than the others is gluttony. Like you you could get that done, but sure, I guess yeah, I guess I just I guess I can sort of reconcile that with what's going on with the rest of the movie, but it's also like it, it it's just a more specific version of like the the evil that they embody already. Um, yeah, which is why I think they abandon it because there's more than seven of them. Yeah, so. so it doesn't quite make sense. It was probably just a holdover. But it does help characterize them yeah. in interesting ways that I think is still relevant. And uh, yeah, I think uh, we're probably not going to bring it up too much because we watched this movie without the volume up, but I think Trevor Jones's score oh, does yeah. a pretty solid job um, helping to set... Oh, there he is. Chamberlain. Austin's favorite character. Far more important than Trevor Jones. I'm sorry, Trevor Jones, if you're listening to this, but you really cannot compete. Your music is just not as good as him going, mm. I'm sorry. Nobody wants to hear that. It's not true. Really, my whole thing about him doing that is uh, just, I like bringing it up because it annoys Max. <laughs> <laughs> no, before you knew, you knew it annoyed me yesterday, you're like, we need to keep track of how many times he does that because it's the best thing in the movie. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> I anticipate what's going to annoy you. I think I have a pretty good, like, you know, l like understanding of that by now. Uh, 60, 40, I would say. You're, you're in the positive. But. Okay, good. Uh, baby steps, right? So here's an interesting thing, too. We're going to notice now in this opening narration, if you'll pay attention, and most lis uh, listeners will probably pick up on this at this point, um, you will see that the opening narration is doing two things that are kind of contradictory. And it's interesting. Uh, it is establishing the type of black and white morality and cosmology that you would come to expect from a lot of different sort of fantasy movies like this. However, it immediately and simultaneously complicates that understanding of the world by creating very deliberate, you know, parallels and mirroring between the Uru, that's what they're called, the mystics, yes. the Uru, I guess, the mystics, and the Skeksis, right? And it very, very early on does a good job of establishing how there is a sense of balance and coordination between one group and the other. And, uh, you know, it even describes them uh, in similar ways. It's not just the stuff where you see them both sort of organizing a star chart or something, right? and uh, participating in a group ritual. But it says stuff where it's like, you know, uh, on this day, the Skeksis took no... Is he naked? No, I think he has a loincloth on. Jesus Christ, I hope so. That's the last thing I want to think about. Well, his dick is obviously very much smaller than David Bowie's, so we don't <laughs> have to see it. But... Oh, my God. Are you sure? That could be an auteur touch from uh, Jim Henson. And I don't want Jim to have a big swinging dick. <laughs> Frank Oz was just like, Jim, we have to sell this to children. <laughs> Frank, maybe it was Frank Oz's idea. And then he had to, he was, Yoda was going to be really different originally. Yeah. <laughs> mm. 
But yes, so I off mean, that tangent. Yoda was the one who says size matters not. So <laughs> I don't think it would have been him. You're right. It's a very good point. It's not compatible with his <laughs> with his like ethos. Um, but yes, so again, just to go back to what we were saying, creating very clear parallels and also um, the, the interesting touch of, you know, having them engage with the idea of ritual, you know, and a ritual in this instance is kind of like an abstraction of like social mores and behaviors at large, you know? So they really do good, like a solid job just in that simple decision to structure it in this way to uh, demonstrate not only that these two groups are visually different, but, you know, definitely their visual difference is reinforced by a sociological difference. Yeah. You know, they're very sort of opposed opposite behaviors, but they still have that link between them, which is important. They're very similar. We get parallel narration in the opening Mm -hmm. with an emperor lace dying and the oldest mystic lace dying. And yeah, they don't really care about the emperor dying (laughs) with the, everybody is deeply saddened by the mystic passing. Like you said, so it's a very simple, good, bad dichotomy which is very common in fantasy and some people think it's played out and too simplistic it's like oh we need to make everything morally gray in fantasy now for some things i think that works this movie does not need to be morally gray well it i think it is morally gray because i think but it's a different type of morally gray than something like game of thrones yeah which is a more literal and sort of obvious approach to being morally gray i think which it does well it at some points. But sure. Like, I mean, I haven't watched since very early in the show, yeah. but when I did, I thought, you know, he, he is very committed, at least in that early part of the show to, you know, they're like, no, we're going to make you feel uncomfortable about different people at different times. And then later on, make you uncomfortable about the fact that you now sort of have to them. admit that somebody did something that is like, okay, you know, like, and it's all about putting people in that location of discomfort where it's like, you can't it, you can, you can't just judge them like that, you know? That's what people expect and what they want, but it's not always the way it's going to be. And if you can do that well, obviously it becomes really popular, right? Because people like stuff like that because it's confrontational in an interesting way. Um, but this one, again, is is different because it's less about character and more about, you know, like the ontological construction of the universe, you know? You expect things to be established in this simplistic... Uh, black and white way a lot, but also it's like in no in the very fabric of the world, there is there's an absence of that ability to to put things into boxes because they are connected from the very beginning. Do you know what I mean? I yeah. I feel like there's more to say about the difference, and there's a better way to describe it. But it's not it's not merely that people are people. You know, it's that that like everything is kind of connected and that everyone has a responsibility for someone else, you know? But we're also introduced to our main character, Jen. Yes. Um, With this big swinging dick. No. Sorry, I won't bring that up again. Yes, you will. I probably will because he's going to meet a lady lady later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Who's not very impressed with him. (laughs) But... (laughs) But yeah, no, he's he's our main. For all the amazing puppetry in this movie, you don't like Jen. I get why you want him to be simple. Yeah, simplistic. He's the big eyes, makes him very sympathetic. He's very open, mm. as opposed to the beady eye. <laughs> yeah, Skeksis. Because it's so they're distrustful inherently. You know that just by looking at them. Well, yeah, obviously, and they have wrinkled dark yeah skin to show that they're old and gross and untrustworthy and they make noises yeah and jen is but he's smooth is it just that you think he's too vanilla like yeah kind of uh, some not even that like i'm fine with his character being vanilla because like this is a very standard fantasy story for the most part and i'm okay with that i just want him to be slightly more visually interesting that's that's my main thing about that. Yeah, I don't mind. You know, it's weird because definitely when we see Kira later, for some reason, despite how similar they are, she for some reason just looks more interesting. Yeah. I don't know what it is. Could it just be the hair? Kind of, yeah. You know, like... And she's introduced 
with more personality to begin with. Well, she, yeah, she's just a better character, I think. And I think the, we'll talk about it later, but uh, we're also, do you want to just get back to it after we finish this amazing emperor bit? Yeah. It's interesting that they establish the Skeksis as these gross, disgusting creatures, and they somehow managed to make, they still managed to make the emperor the most disgusting of them. <laughs> yeah. It's like, we did it once, and now we're going to, you know, we're going to outdo ourselves again. I don't know. I, I, in all types of fantasy, I like weird bird creatures. <laughs> I think these guys are great, honestly. Skeksis are probably, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if I would say they're my favorite creation, but they are definitely are the most expressive group of yeah. people. And honestly, the, the Uru, I mean, oh, God, that's such an amazing decision, too. He doesn't just, like, die. He just dissolves. Yeah. Again, it, it's a mirroring thing of, like, you know, the mystic, the head mystic has to dissolve, right? But then he does. He, he becomes one with the force. Y- yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, he but, just billows away to dust. Yes. Because they hang on to life so desperately with the power of the crystal. Whereas he sort of becomes alabaster. Yeah. Sort of. He looks like he's becoming marble, you know, and then he vanishes. Although it sort of looks like his hair is going to remain there for a little bit. <laughs> which also okay you and i another funny thing since we just did pacific rim last week i think when we watched this movie for the pre-screening we noticed a lot of similarities between guillermo del toro movies in this one yeah and uh that alabaster thing is kind of one as well isn't it from hellboy 2 when the elves die they don't disappear but they do turn into like marble yeah, right like it's almost like sap, almost not sap but like amber type thing. yeah yeah but it does have that like very you know, pale stone yeah. look to it, you know? Oh, take your shit. <laughs> you left all this shit behind. We don't have room for it. This is probably the strangest moment to me because when they set up this dichotomy and, and, and again, also we're going to get back to at some point, you know, the questions of like species and race and how they work in this movie. Yeah. Um, and whether or not, it, you know, you might view it as problematic, the idea of these characters, which I'm going to say it's more complicated than just saying they're the noble savage. But let's have that conversation later. Um, oh, God, amazing matte painting. That's one of the best matte paintings I've ever seen in it terms of how really it blends. Is, yeah. And, you know, Especially I, how, like, you can still see the river flowing, whatnot. And yes, it definitely is. It, lo- it looks like something, a matte painting that they, they made in depth. Yes. You know, where it's like definitely part of it is interacting with the actual set space that they have and it's really all the map paintings in this are really incredible you you do they use the limitation of their medium like a lot of these wide shots are gen are actual live actor just walking around sets or or on location oh i wrote the name of that actor down and i forget it now but i think that one actor um he did the performances for almost all the all the people who were, you know, when they had to put the actual suit on for scale, right? I think he did most of those performances. I'll put it in the show notes. So uh, the thing I was going to mention, though, about when they send him his belongings, I thought that was very bizarre because definitely this is the less materialistic group of these two societies. But also that seems directly contradictory to, like this entire movie's like ethos at its core, which is this movie is fundamentally about the interconnectedness of objects and things existing in the same world. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think the shattering of the dark crystal is very much something that's like a big bang event. If you can think of it that way, where it's like you have nothing and then explosion and then you get all this stuff. Right. And then eventually it must contract and return. But when he goes to the afterlife or whatever, you're just severing completely this guy and his the material belongings from the world they're in, which is weird. I'm sorry, we're we're getting to trial by stone. This is a great this is a great scene. This is definitely some of the Jim Henson cleverness that I don't think you get in Labyrinth. Yeah. Because Labyrinth has some fun moments with different like set pieces and stuff. But the thing with this is that, you know, you you get just the great imagery of this you know where it's like you know it doesn't quite make sense as we'll talk about (laughs) because the stone is still there from the last time even though nobody nobody broke it well i think that was the whole thing of just like it's supposed to be who can make like the biggest dent in the stone then how do you measure that 
it I, one it doesn't matter no it but, doesn't really matter but, but i think it was supposed to be the, like the general like unabashed like there was no way that chamberlain could win because the general just like broke the stone in half yeah he just beat you down he 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 like unabashedly won there was no way you could come back yeah from that. so which he, you don't expect honestly in this type of movie you expect like the suspicious evil vizier to usurp the dumb military general type but like i i remember like upon rewatching this i had forgotten that chamberlain was stripped of his rank because in this type of fantasy movie it's just like oh no he uses his clever wit out with the dumb general it is so. interesting um in in the most stupid type of movie you get the general character just because they're the most obvious vision of villainy yeah. where they're like, they're tough. They're a bad guy. Right. And then in some that are more interesting in terms of their character decisions, you get like, Oh, they're not just a bad guy. They're like a worm, you yeah. know, like they're, they're weasels and they're like repulsive too. Um, and in this one, it's kind of a mixture of both where, you know, we see that, <laughs> that that the Chamberlain is kind of repulsive in that way, but also he has that back and forth morality as well. Where honestly, I don't think the movie does give you any cues throughout that middle portion whether or not he genuinely wants to try to reconcile yeah. or he's just using them to his own ends. I think if you had to go on one side or the other, you would have to say that he's being selfish again and he's yeah. trying to trick them because it, it, there is a very much an unequivocal evil here in the like ontologically the Skeksis are evil yes. it's not a matter of perspective literally in the world they are the embodiment of evil this is tr <laughs> this is what it is you know they are absolutely uh, the bad parts of this world embodied in one sort of group society species and that's like a cosmic truth. You can't argue against that. So I definitely think the Chamberlain is uh, kind of, I don't know, he's kind of uh, mm. suspicious at that point in the middle of the movie. This is so disturbing, by the way. Yeah, this is like, uh, I know Jim Henson was trying to go darker for this movie. He, If I remember his thoughts on it, he thought that kids liked to be scared. They liked to be creeped out and weirded sure. out. And it was a problem that that was being removed from children's media, which I agree with. Like I, I loved weird, creepy shit when I was a kid, but, um, but you think this is like what a whole nother level. They I, even no. add like spit to his mouth. Like, no, it's, I, I think this is great. I think this is like the perfect example of that, of him going hard in with that idea without, like, it's just crazy because it's like, it's almost like the idea of trying to make a movie. And we'll talk about whether or not this is actually a kid's movie or what that means for it to be a kid's movie. Um, but he definitely, he is Jim Henson, right? Yes. What is his brand right now? This movie was shot back to back with, I think the great Muppet caper. Yeah. So well, one of the Muppets movies. Yes. So like part of the thing is he knows his brand. He knows what people expects and he knows what he wants to make for the more. Um, it's not a movie aimed exclusively at adults. You know, it's not like, Manhunter, <laughs> right? Manhunter. But, uh, you know, I think part of the interesting thing is when you're trying to reach a more, when you're trying to make a movie that is, has the goal of reaching children a little bit more yeah. than other movies, it leads you to try to communicate plot points that in a more like emotional way you know, with a more emotional logic that you might not otherwise. Like, that's why I feel like that declothing scene is so effective because it has undertones of all types of different disturbing things about, like, like just weird types of abuse and, like, destruction of his identity, right? But it has to do it in this very simple, straightforward, emotional way. So it forces you to, like, couch these disturbing things in just a simple moment, well, you know? especially since, like, they do have very different faces for a lot of them, but like they do look sort of similar and like, that's how you identified them. Like yeah. the general was the dark, yeah, evil color bland wearing one. And then the Chamberlain was the one with the bright red layered yeah, thing. So it's just like, it's stripping them of their identity completely. Yeah. And I think that's why when you look back at like movies that you watched as a kid and you're like, Oh my God, I can't believe I watched that as an adult. It's only yeah. because well, that's actually a function of what it means to address children. It's not that, you know, in those good movies, they don't talk down to children. They just make it accessible 
And all that means is that they take something that would maybe be more literal and therefore less clever or intelligent in an adult movie, and they make it more expressive and communicative, right? And it, in doing so, they hide it a little bit. But we've been talking over the introduction to the Gartham, who I fucking love. Yeah. I mean, I said before that there are some puppets that are better made than the Skeksis. And I think, like, those are obviously the best made puppets in the movie. They mm-hmm. look so great. I definitely would agree. The they, Gartham are, you know, definitely the Skeksis have more opportunity for performance. Yeah. You know, and they are they have to be more expressive. But the Gartham... I think it's a gr- like a perfect marriage between their function and the story. Another amazing map painting. Wow. It's really phenomenal. There's uh, going to be a lot of this in the movie just because like there's so many different times where you're just like, yeah. oh my God, this is so great. But I, I think the Gartham are like the perfect marriage between their form and the story and their design and performance. You know, it's just like they're just perfectly conceived. They're very creepy. They're perfectly introduced where you see them in the background multiple times before they move. Yeah. And the first time you see it like come to life, you're like, wait, what am I looking at? And then it's a, light, I, its eyes light up. I thought like, that was a statue. What the like? But even when it starts moving, you can't really tell what it is. And yeah. then you're like, it's a horseshoe crab thing. Oh God, I love it so much. And definitely they, they, I, I think the the idea of having the Gartham is something that's interesting because you know, we mentioned some ideas of like race already, but you can definitely pull some like post-colonial readings out of this movie. Um, and not the least of which would be the idea of how the Gartham exterminated the Gelfling race, yeah. you know, or they helped to do so um, under the, uh, you know, the supervision of yeah. the, of the Skeksis. Well, yes, because the, there's the prophecy that they inadvertently made come true. Which is always the case in yeah. these sorts of things. And here we have Agra. <laughs> Voiced by Frank Oz. Yes. And originally, I think... I There I, was like two other people that were supposed to voice her, I think. Um, or wait a second. Is she voiced by Frank Oz? Yeah, she is. Okay. Because I, I thought I had read that Frank Oz was the one who did the original voice, but they're like, this is just... This is too similar to Yoda. I think they needed to change his performance. <laughs> Uh, there was one performer where I don't know. There was another one that they didn't like the performance and they brought in Frank Oz. And I think Frank Oz's first take was too weird for them. So they had to have him do a different type of voice. But God, that's, that's by the way, I don't want to interrupt what you're going on, but like, that is one of my favorite lines in this movie. Yeah. Where is he? He's dead. Oh, he could be anyway then. Yeah. <laughs> that's so great. I love that. And it's perfectly at home here in this movie. Cause this movie is so much about the interconnectedness of things. And I do love this moment too, though. What? Where it's just like, oh, all you want is a crystal charger or whatever. Like, <laughs> it's so important to the plot. It's so important to Jed. And it's all he has to go on from his dead mentor. And it's just like, oh, I don't fucking care about that. I have them in a fucking bag. I'll throw them on a table. It's uh, it's great. Because normally you'd just be like, oh, you have to pass a test to prove you are worth No, this is what I have lying around. I'm much more concerned about my functional full scale model of how all the planets move. I think it's called an orrery. Yeah. Is that something. device? I don't know. I'm not, you know, an astronomer. Um, but they always look so cool in movies, and you never know, like, exactly what they're used for. <laughs> yeah. Because technically, if it's just a model, you don't ne- ever need it to be that large, but it always takes up the entire fucking room. <laughs> why wouldn't you? I guess, yeah, why not? It's a Also, great- one of them, like, when you see it, like, as a blade attached to one of them, like, look... <laughs> You have like a fucking like axe handle or yeah, cling on like, sword at the end of one of them. Is it just supposed to track what? a radius of movement for planets? Yeah, and why do you have all the blades around it? Why does it like I get it maybe it's like supposed to be protractors to measure angles and like what degree yeah. the planet is. Also, at. I know that this is totally nitpicking, but I 100% know for a fact that if this was actually true and these different planets moved this way, a bunch would definitely smash into each other. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I know it's supposed to be like the three suns are about to line up. Yeah. That's an important thing. But Or actually, you know what? Maybe Jim Henson is the type of obsessive person to actually look at this artery and be like, so you can make it move in a way where none of them actually smash into each other, right? Yeah. They just barely miss all everyone. That would be kind of interesting. I do like how like we have to see her like duck and cover from it because like <laughs> there are blades attached to it and it's just yeah. going to cut her in half otherwise, but... Yeah, it's a really great prop. It is. And like a lot of Jim Henson stuff, there's just like 
how could all of these planets be so close together and constantly move? Like it's so, well, that doesn't matter. No, it doesn't matter, but it's so extra, but that adds this extra level of detail that makes it wonderful. Yeah. I mean, again, it's, it's the idea of the thing, right? You're, you're taking this thing, but we're accepting it in our fantasy movie logic. And also with just a certain suspension of disbelief for this movie, which it earns through its commitment to its world and everything. And, uh, you know, you could have very easily just had like, this is the planet we live on. These are the three suns. This is when it's going to line up. But no, we're going to have 50 fucking planets. But that, yeah, but that's not the point. The point is to drink in this world yeah. as something that is like, you you know, you only glimpse different ang- corners of it at any given point and you can't really get the whole picture. But taken together in the entire movie, it becomes this majestic sort of expanse of this world that is beyond your scope to appreciate, but you, everything yeah. you come into contact with is just more evidence of how amazing it is, no matter how small it is. You know, This is obviously a model of something that is very large, the entire like universe for them, but it's just as cool and awesome as all the animated you know, leaves and shit that we're going to see later. Yeah. But yeah, so um, I think Agra is also interesting from a post-colonial perspective because I think if you look at Agra and then also just think about Jen and then Kira, they sort of become um, sort of different versions of like characters in exile almost. Like obviously, and and it's a plot point for Jen too. His race was exterminated for like, because of the existence of their species. Yeah. (laughs) You know, And, and the same with Kira obviously. But then also like it makes you wonder about different, species and groups of people in this world like the way you know like what are we supposed to make of agra who seems to be her own species yeah there's no one else like her but she's also a kind of exile right and she kind of also exists as an exile sort of uh i don't know like an attachment to the uru where they know of her but she's not part of them or you know it's interesting they share the same knowledge because on the floor yeah under the big uh model of the universe we see like the same layout of the sand drawing that they were making before because yeah. it's the same type of thing but she's just taking a more scientific approach to it rather than the spiritual approach that they're taking well so. they also have a scientific approach right we know yeah. that they taught jen math yeah and and, and he, they taught me math and shapes <laughs> and numbers and uh, to play my flute in the year all you really need in life that would be that's basically like Jen's like Tinder bio for when he's trying to pick up Kira and it's just like the shittiest thing ever and she's like oh you're the only one. God damn it! It's either you or one of these fucking crab monsters. So. Oh god. And again, I think uh, you know <laughs> that's a bad shot. I'm sorry. That is a bad shot with the animation of Jen there where he looks at the crystal mm-hmm. and he's just like dirt. They're okay. It's gonna be real easy for us to like just shit on Jen. We've missed a few opportunities so far, which I'm kind of happy about because it's just like, it's just like, but there's like, just the line delivery is really not great in certain points. And then, and as, as somebody who loves fantasy there, it's very rare that I like the main character in fantasy things because a lot of times their thing is like, okay, they're the chosen one. They're their hero. But they're also very bland because we want everybody watching this to project onto them. Yes. Which a lot of times backfires and it's just like... Well, it gets back sort of to part of our problem with Labyrinth, which is like you always, they are, there's always the assumption that you need... By the way, this shot is kind of amazing. Yeah. You have the real actor who falls down the hill and then you transition here to... The puppet. Yeah, the, the scale puppet. Yeah. It's just like Jurassic Park shit, basically. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like you were saying, it, it's kind of like our thing with Labyrinth where it's like... You know, you have to have the character who is normal, who gets all the exposition, right, to set up this stuff. But again, Labyrinth falls more into that trap. And part of the reason why that that's kind of aggravating for us is not just because I think we found that character annoying as a character, deliberately so. They went overboard with it. Um, but also because it's like it completely discounts our ability to pick up on any of those details as a spectator and it almost eliminates the like the world as an object of pure spectacle, you know, it sort of diminishes awe because it has to contextualize it 
in the like narrative and mindset of this character. Yeah. And then like, because you're spending so much time just being like identify with this character. If I happen to like a different character better or like want to learn more about them, the movies are already committed to focusing on this bland uh, insert yourself here thing. So I, sorry, can I just interrupt you for a second? I'm just thinking like <laughs> worst road trip ever. Like, that's their version of the straight story with David Lynch the movie about the guy who goes across several states in his tractor at two miles an hour. <laughs> oh, man. But this is amazing, right? Uh, and I'll get back to what you were saying in one second. Don't let me forget that. Not but all. I think this is maybe my favorite sequence in the movie. And that's because, uh, you know, we've been doing, you know, certain movies that we've talked about cinema of attractions lately on this show. And uh, this is definitely part of that. I mean, what is the point of this? This is completely non-narrative. And yet it's sort of like, you know, as pretentious as it sounds, it's kind of like a study in motion where he takes all these like, you know, choreographed moves he's created for these objects in nature and these different animals. And then he, he makes it just like something that the camera can just sort of fawn over and just gaze at from one scene to the next. And technically we learn now that it's an establishing shot for this location, but it's like, we just take a time out from the narrative and look at all this, but it works because that is the premise of the movie. Look at all these little details that inhabit this world though. Like and labyrinth had things like that, but it was more like subtle stuff that we'd never got time to focus on for a lot of it. It was like, and I appreciate it in labyrinth when it's great. Like you have the, like little spiders crawling up walls mm -hmm. that don't add anything, but it's just like, I mean, there's a spider there. Why not? Yeah. You have like yeah, cool little things with all the henchmen. You have like, <laughs> however, I, I wager you this. If you had a moment like that in Labyrinth, I can't remember if there is one off the top of my head where literally there is no narrative use whatsoever. And it is just sort of becoming a kind of documentary in its world building attempt to just show us the stuff and not really commented on it, on it at all. I reckon that even though that would be amazing because we know it's Jim Henson, wouldn't work in that movie because that's not what that story's about. That's what this this movie is about, though. It is about everything, and it is about it. It, it is about sort of drawing the connections between these characters and the world they live in as two things that are not discrete from one another, right? Yeah, everything is related to the next thing, and it sounds kind of like hippie, but I think this is kind of like a hippie movie. Uh, which is an interesting thing to talk about in terms of its genre. But one thing I wanted to go back and mention before we meet Kira here is uh, when you mentioned the thing about them having to get exposition as a bland main character and everything, right? And how they constantly focus on trying to get you to identify with them. Think about what that does. If they have to be the bland identifying character and part of the thing that makes them easy to identify with is more similar to you, you are now refusing to allow them to be part of the world. Yeah. Which then means that they're not a real character existing in the world. It's just that you're making them more boring than everything else around them. You know? Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a good move we can't all the give time. Them in, we can't give them definable personality traits because you might not share those personality yeah, traits. Yeah, they can't be as much of a part of the world. Yeah, it's a real restriction to, to put them in that position. But yes, we have met Fizzgig and the best character in the movie, Kira. And it's weird because, like, yeah, her hair is slightly longer than Jen's, but Jen has, like, if Jen was bald, I'd, I don't know. Maybe Kara, just because she has more inflection in her voice, she has a little fun, fuzzy thing, which I was talk, yeah, telling Austin before Frank Oz fought to have Fizzgig put in the movie, which is wonderful. Oh, I think Fizzgig, Fizzgig is fun. Yeah. Oh. He does kind of come off as the type of thing that exists only for a plushy toy to be made. But yeah. you can't find one, folks, actually. So, uh, yeah, did not take the George Lucas route in this movie. <laughs> I mean, uh, Jim Henson yeah, historically hated marketing. Like, he didn't even want to sell toys yeah. for Sesame Street when that came out. Mm -hmm. um, actually, that came back. To, <laughs> that came back. They talked to Jim Henson about the toys. He's like, yes, I want to sell toys about the children being slaughtered. <laughs> but um, actually... I think it was one of his like producers or whatever said like, no, you got to sell it. You can use the money you get from the toys from Sesame street to fund future projects. And then when they were making dark crystal, dark crystal started to mountain mountain costs. And the, that same producer oh, came yeah. to him and was just like, told you it was just, no, the producer was like, we're spending too much money on this movie. And Jim Henson's like, what are you talking about? We have all that money from ah, Sesame street. To there toys. you go. 
He got him. Well, I guess that's the other thing to mention. This might be the most ambitious movie we've covered so far on the show. It's this up is there. insane yeah. in the ambition to do this. And it only costs it's, $15 million to make. Yeah. And I know that's in That's my, sort of just a medium budget thing at yeah. the time, though. You know, like obviously there's a degree of inflation, but that's still very impressive. And by the way, speaking of Guillermo del Toro, we just talked over Kira's yeah. introduction. It was striking to us how similar it was to the elf princess from Hellboy 2. Yeah. And that you also carry over the thing where Abe and the elf princess both have that ability to, through contact with other people and then objects, like access a certain like history, a certain cultural history, um, just through touching. And definitely they have that mind melting moment there. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's even, it's crazy because it's even like when the elf princess is introduced and you see the lines that run on her face, right? It's very similar to the, like the way the shadow falls on Kira's face and in this. Yeah, I'm not, we're not saying it's like a fucking Guillermo del Toro, we found you out, you're a hack fraud. But no, it's just like, of course Guillermo del Toro has seen this movie. Well, like, it's not just that. It's like a lot of good filmmakers will, one, draw from things sometimes very directly and that doesn't make it not work but also like clearly it's not just he's drawing on an aesthetic it is i'm taking an idea about yeah. this and it's worth mentioning too that hellboy and hellboy 2 are very much movies that you can look in a post-colonial manner where you know these are two characters who are on the brink of extinction right and that's a lot of what hellboy 2 is about yeah this is the last, this is the last, you know, Giant person treat. of this. Yeah. yeah. We're the last of our line. We're the last of this, you know, the old world is dying to be destroyed and replaced. That's why it's a very sad movie. And definitely like this movie kind of has that buried in it as well. And this is where I think, you know, the characterization of the Skeksis as the seven deadly sins definitely comes into play more. Yeah. Well, there's seven of them left now, so it makes sense. But are there? I think so. There, because the emperor died. There'd be eight. Chamberlain was kicked out. So that's ten, nine, eight. Is there eight or seven? I don't know. There should be eight. At any rate, this is just another non-narrative yeah. moment, though. And again, I love. I mean, we don't even have to say that we love the way this is done. You know, like there's yeah. really no point to saying that. Um, if only I had more, you know, knowledge just of how all this shit was made, you know, and, and the ability required to puppet this stuff. Cause it really is just daunting. The idea of that. How many of these this. puppets do you think still exist at oh, all? I don't know. I definitely feel like, you know, Jim Henson was the type of person to, uh, save certain things if he thought they were valuable. But I also know for a fact that a lot of these puppets were repurposed, uh, later on for different things. Um, yeah. I know the podlings were repurposed as goblins in Labyrinth. And uh, yeah, I don't know if any of these went into Fraggle Rock. So tweet at us, Fraggle Rock stands. <laughs> no, you're right. There are eight left. I was in, yeah, including the Emperor <laughs> the poor as one of the original podling. eight or nine. But I guess he doesn't count because he just dissolves instantly. So yeah, in terms of seven deadly sins, this is a good opportunity to characterize again just what are what are the Skeksis? How how do we look at them? They're very decadent. They're kind of aristocratic. Yeah. Uh, they. You have one that literally looks like Cruella de Vil, or. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they uh, they consume voraciously, right? Um, and they have a certain like industrial quality to them. Although not super industrial, it more just feels like, I don't know, more so indus than industrial, it just feels like decadent, you know? Yeah. They feel like very old world, you know? They're but, old money. They they deserve this. They've always been this way, even though they took it by force. Yeah, and it's like, they. they it feels more like a castle than it does like a class thing where it's like they're in, in like industrial, you know? Like they take slaves, but it is not characterized in a manner where I would say it's like it, it's an embodiment truly of a class thing or it's just an older version of a class thing, you know, where it's like these are this is royal aristocracy. This is not like, you know, uh, I guess financial. Right. 
I'm sorry. I love Ocker just being like, you're a fucking idiot. You're looking for the geef, like not for me. Why am I here? And this is the other interesting thing that I know I mentioned to you yesterday in terms of other things this movie reminds me of. And uh, this movie reminds me a lot of Dark Souls. And there's a lot of reasons why. I think it begins with the premise of like the thing that, that there's a perfect unity in the world at the very beginning, but there's also like nothingness, right? And then this object enters it and it's like sort of splinters and shatters in all directions, right? And then all these different people take possession of maybe different pieces and it's like a yeah. power struggle. And then the whole plot of the story is trying to, you know, rejoin these things into one, right? Um, and they're both very much about decay and decline and even just the design of everything. Right. It's like, well, yeah, you said it before they were like the Skeksis were decadent, but like all of their clothes are just like rotting and yeah, they're dirty like, and yeah, it's like they're moth eaten sort yeah. of like, and, and it feels very much like, like very faded glory and like clinging to a thing that clearly is ancient, you know? Um, but clinging to it with like in a very personal and emotional and desperate way that is kind of disturbing. Um, and then also the, just the idea of like people like these two different groups having to like, you know, following rituals that they no longer remember the meaning of or purpose for. They just do it because it brings them comfort and that's the way it's always been, you know? Um, and I think, I don't know what it is. I think it's just maybe the way the world is, but I think stories that effectively embody this idea of decay are very disturbing to me, <laughs> you know? like Maybe it's just our contemporary society. Yeah, and, and like decay and the idea of like entropy growing beyond your capacity to, to ever contain it or deal with it in any rational way, you know? Yeah. Like it, it always leads you to a type of story that has like apocalyptic implications, you know? Oh, uh, we got our rainbow connection scene here. Rainbow connection? No, the Muppets, Kermit the Frog. Oh, he's hidden in the swamp somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> we already see that Kira is more effective. <laughs> This is the problem. I think the movie wants it to be, especially in the way it introduces them, it wants it to be that like they they need one another to succeed in this and yeah. that they have complementary skills that they can use in different circumstances, right? But visually, it doesn't really happen that way. And actually, in terms of like plot moments, it doesn't happen that way much really either. I think Kira really takes control as like, you know, the one who has agency in terms of making these decisions, right? Yeah. And then, she can control the wildlife. She can fucking hit a crystal bat yeah. from out of the air, mid sky. She saves them yeah. a lot, you know. And it's like, I does Jen find a way to use his skills in a way that is like gonna save them, or is it even in like a way that is relevant, much less save them? You know, yeah. like she pretty much does everything for the rest of the movie. And while that does have like the the positive effect of making her a more interesting, engaging character. It's like, can we find a way to get Jen involved and not just make him some sort of useless, like, sack of potatoes? And was Jen really necessary for this? Couldn't have this just been Kira's story? Or, I don't know, maybe flip them or, like... And I don't mean flip them in the sense that Jen... Is useless. Or, I mean, Kira is our lead and then she's useless. Yeah. It's just, can we not make one of them useless <laughs> and the other one, you know, much better than them? Because it, it doesn't really work as well. Like... You have, so... <laughs> I love that podling clapping. If we're going for the classic, like, chosen one fantasy story, Jen would be, he's destined to be, like, a great knight or whatever, and Kira would be the princess equivalent. Right. And in that story, the the knight character usually starts off as useless. He, he always dreamed of being, like, doing greater things, going off and... I'm going to like being a great warrior, but he's not good at it yet. Yes. And then you introduce the princess character who's more aware of what's going on in the world and has some skills. And she's there to get him from point A to point B when he'll be the right. stronger thing. But Jen, like the, we don't really know what Jen wants. Well, he just, 
he's too bland and also he's too much the innocent. Yeah. You know, again, it is exactly, it is, I guess it is also falling into that trap where, you know, it's more specific in Labyrinth because they also want her to be shitty. And part of it is learning. It's part of that movie is her learning not to be a brat, Jennifer Connelly. Yeah. Whereas this, it's like, they are just trying to make it the bland chosen one. And it's like, but you're, there's just nothing about you, you know? And I think because of the identification thing, they maybe felt like they had to, I guess, like outsource his like interestingness to, to jet to uh, Kira. But then she just becomes more interesting because she has to do all the plot lifting to get them from this part to the next part. And really, you know, it doesn't even engage with the idea of the chosen one to the same like level of depth because it's like, you know, really, is it just one of them? I guess literally just one of them puts the stone, the the crystal shard back in the crystal. Yeah. But pretty much if you're actually looking at who's more responsible, <laughs> it's going to be Kira. Which, by the way, I just love the design of these podlings. They're uh, very They're funny fun. and silly. They, do, they are the most Muppety of the things, yeah. I would say, but that's not a bad thing. For some reason, they remind me of like a bunch of old grandmas <laughs> in Babushka. Like, yeah. That's your favorite yeah. word. You've said, Babushka? you've said that so many different times on the podcast, but I do love That's it. It's not true at all. Fine. You're literally, are you insane? Are play you kidding the, me? Play that back. Play audience. Go, go find all the clips. Babushka. The <laughs> Fizzy. Yes. And then the very disturbing Gartham show up again. I'd like to, uh, to, uh, be able to have a little Gartham that I can throw at Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> Not even like an alive one or a functioning one, just just a heavy puppet. But oh no no no, I mean like a living, real Garthim, but not that big, because I need to throw it, because they need to know it comes from me. <laughs> Where did the Garthim come from? Fuck yeah, fuck milkshakes. We're throwing crab monsters at them now. There's concrete in these crab monsters. I can use a milkshake. I don't. <laughs> I'm not going to eat the crab monster. Ooh, that's creepy. Yeah. Again, just more types of variations of post-colonial imagery, right? This type of raid. And the Garthim yet again, like, they fail completely in their mission of just like, uh, let's just grab things. What's ever around. The other interesting thing about the Garthim is like, they're so well conceived in how they move that it feels like a Toho level thing yeah. where it's like it's almost like they transcend scale where it's like i could sh easily imagine like a like in a godzilla movie like a gar theme like marching across a mountain you know yeah. as like a huge one there's something very specific about the way they move that makes it it's lumbering it's but also it looks totally appropriate you know i feel like a big mistake with like super huge animals or things in movies is that maybe sometimes in the way they animate it, it just looks a little bit too slow. Yeah. Maybe that is anatomically correct, but it's like animals, big animals are still kind of live. Like elephants are lively and yeah. they can, they're more like agile yeah, <laughs> than even, people think, you know, even hippos, an animal we so like associate with sloth yeah. and whatnot, though they can run short distances, 30 miles per hour. <laughs> like, can you imagine seeing that? But even the way they just turn and move, yeah. you know, like big animals aren't like, I don't know. They're, they're not like fucking a, like a Colossus, you know? And here I'm, I'm good at things again. So Max, this is probably good. This little interlude where not yeah. much is happening. This is probably a good time to talk about the genre of this movie. I know that uh, we haven't talked about this really on the show, but we've been thinking about trying to maybe do some different fantasy movies that might be interesting. And I think yes. this is part of that, although it is more specific because definitely, you know, more so than like an instance of the fantasy genre, I think people would think of this mostly in reference to Jim Henson. Yeah. Which is maybe not fair because it is a fantasy movie. But I think it is interesting in how it plays a role in like this weird fantasy cycle that is kind of going on at this time. Sorry, that bird that reminded me of reverse the... reverse toucan. Yeah, no, it reminded me of the terrifying uh, orange things that take off their head in Labyrinth that scar me to this day. Why? Just the head was like... The ones that sing that awful song? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, everybody. I didn't mean to put you... <laughs> put you back. That's why we had to remember that. By the way, do you think they did it? Nah. I don't think so either. It is that moment, but 
But the way they're lying next to each other, I mean, I don't think Jen understands. Man. Also, if he if they they, they, did, they only taught him math shapes and how to play the flute. Here's the thing. Sex it, ed was not on that list. <laughs> it we're gonna get to that later because I think the best line in this movie, and actually I just really love this line in general. I'm really in love this with, with this line about the wings. Yeah. If they did do it, he would have seen those wings. So they didn't, clearly. <laughs> but um yeah, I was going to bring up the whole fantasy genre thing. And I think this movie is participating in a, like a cycle of fantasy that is, is sort of the first wave of fantasy in movies. And here's the interesting thing, because you and I were talking about this. We were like, God, there's really like not a long tradition of fantasy movies in film. And it's kind of seems to have really solidified in the mainstream with Lord of the Rings. Yeah, and before that it was just like it odd really things. low budget schlock for the most part. Or though. just like different things that are kind of not really taking on that shape. Yeah. And then even it's it's not like it lasted long after Lord of the Rings because it seems you know the film industry has grown so homogenized at the top with these big budget movies that you don't get as many like fantasy movies like that in that high profile way. You get cheap shit like that stupid uh jeff bridges movie yeah yeah that i don't even that know one where, yeah where the, basically does that even count not really um but it's you know it's mostly just superhero movies is where the fantasy is right and i wouldn't say that's a fantasy movie no it's closer to sci-fi than anything but yeah like. but the interesting thing about that is that i realized while thinking about it this week oh that makes sense why there aren't as many fantasy movies prior to that because you know what fantasy really as a genre when did it start? It started in the fucking 50s and 60s. That's when it began. I mean, Lord of the Rings becomes popular, right? And, and I think it just takes a few years to become, because that's like a major touchstone for the fantasy genre as we know it today. Before that, it's more specific forms of like pulp type yeah. of fictions and adventure stories, you know? And like sword and sandals, like Conan stuff, you know? And I, I think probably you could point to like the sword and sandals Conan stuff by Robert E. Howard. And then Lord of the Rings is the real two points of Genesis. But even between those things, it's like, it's weird to think about because you assume fantasy would exist for a lot longer, but really the understanding we have right now of like the fantasy genre begins with those two things. There's a lot of other genres that have clearly are fantastical in their elements and everything, but they're kind of different. <laughs> And part of the weird thing about the way movies started to be made of this is because, okay, Lord of the Rings becomes popular in the 50s, 60s or whatever, right? Yeah. So the first fantasy movies, it makes sense to start seeing them, I guess, in the late 60s and throughout the 70s. And you kind of do, you know? Yeah. And uh, it's also interesting because I think the like certain fantasy movies at this time kind of have a post-hippie feel to them, if that makes sense. I mean, with I'm a Jen's hair very much so, but like the general vibe of this movie, definitely where it is, you know, it's about like unity with the world and everything. And it is more intelligent than the phrase post hippie might imply. Right. But I guess I'm pairing this with other movies like uh, something like Fantastic Planet. I don't know if you've seen that where it's that French animated movie, but it's very bizarre. And that one is definitely very clearly like a product of like 70s early seventies, like acid weirdness. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and in some ways this movie reminds me of like Holy mountain, you know, like where it, it's about spiritualism is the thing, you know? And I think this is a specific type of like fantasy type movie that is being made throughout the seventies and sort of eighties that sort of changes when, you know, the, the impact of star Wars takes, takes more of an effect in the American film industry, you start st seeing people take more of a chance on like genre stuff. Um, and I guess another good example of this type of movie is like the Ralph Bakshi movie wizards, which I do not like. <laughs> um, but it is also that sort of thing where it, it's very focused on creating a cosmology and it's sort of a mix between something that feels like a fable and something that feels kind of like, I don't know, spiritual, um, wizards, less spiritual. <laughs> That movie is just kind of like stupid. Um, but again, yeah, the spiritualism is probably something that I'm keying in on. Also, these land striders are awesome. There are so many great creatures. In I this. mean, obviously it is just a dude on stilts, but it's yeah. great that they like, they know the limitations of what they can get away with. And then they design the animal 
around that. So it's like, okay, so we're going to have a guy in stilts, but we're also going to make the animal move and design it in a way that totally takes advantage of that and makes it look realistic. So what is it? It looks like a bat that evolved to walk on the ground, right? It has like the bat wing arms and then just the long limbs. And it's perfect. because, it, <laughs> Yeah, this is the funniest moment in the film. Stay there, fizz gig. I mean, yeah, you could have done this movie without him. I understand where he was coming from, but Frank God was, was right. He's fun. He is. And also, it's just like another little, you know, bit to this world, right? And I think it does help, again, if you are going to, if you are committed to showing Jen as the just innocent, right? Which, again, we've discussed, maybe not the best way to take that. Like, it does help to have Kira have some sort of animal companion because it's like she's more connected. She's more aware. You know, she and she also has a relationship with the world around her. You know, she can talk to animals generally, but she also has a companion one, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think that sort of helps with that. Well, it also helps us like ease into her being able to do that because like we have her animal companion is the first thing that startles him and gets him in the predicament. Sure. So she calms that down. And then when like she's able to calm other animals down, it's it, just it, like, it okay, is, it's an yeah. extension of that. It is kind of preparing you yeah. for that in an interesting way where the logic of it, it, it feels less like a foo-foo, like, oh, that's convenient that she can do that. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Because it sets that up in, a, in an interesting way that provides context for some of her other abilities. But also it provides context for the way nature responds to her in an interesting way that, again, I think feeds into what this movie is about in terms of the connectedness of all objects and all things. Um, and I think, you know, that's part of, again, we haven't really discussed it as much, but part of the big things about why I feel like it's absolutely vital that this movie is made of puppets and real things is not merely in terms of the aesthetic and that I appreciate the like actual physical design that goes into it. It's also that, when you watch this movie and you see literal physical objects that you know for a fact are inanimate and real on their own and are just objects, you see the fact that like, oh, it's not like they're animated to look like real organisms. It's like everything is an object. So it's like there's that weird like crossing of boundaries where it's like in a weird way, all these animals and creatures we see are also just Oh, it's God. yeah, like, but uh, you look at his face deflating, right? And it, you're like, oh, that looks very expressive and real, and obviously very disturbing, the way that performance is being given, <laughs> with the podling who's being tortured right now and being sucked dry for his like life juice. But it's like, you see that in the materiality of it is like, oh, he is sort of like another representation of the dirt and the grass that we see. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Yeah. Whereas if you do compare it to something like the approach of like the Lion King movie, which neither of us have seen, but I think we can both comment on the idea to approach it that way where you do the and CGI. Seen, yeah. Okay. Can I talk about a specific scene? Cause hold on one second. Okay. Cool. I'm just saying like in terms of the approach, yeah. if you do the CGI to make it verisimilitudinous or whatever, I think you lose some of that because it's like, okay, say you got it 100% perfect. It's still not as good as the puppets because it's better than perfect. You know what I mean? If it looked exactly real, you're starting to miss the point. If you, if you retain the fact of it being a puppet very clearly and you embrace the puppetry part of it and you know that these are inanimate objects that are being animated, it's like, oh, again, these are material objects. These are part of the world they belong in. Nobody it, it has an elevated status just because they're an organism or can talk, you know? Everybody exists on the same plane on a continuum with one another. It's very interesting to do it that way. But yeah, I, I know that you watched part of like okay, so, Lion King stuff or... Uh, so I saw a clip and I think it epitomizes perfectly why stylized things like this still hold up better than photorealistic things. Mm-hmm. So the mo what one of the, if not the most iconic scene in The Lion King is when you have Mufasa hanging over the canyon with the stampeding wildebeest. Right. And you have him begging Scar to help him and Scar digs his claws into him and says, long live the king and hits and lets him fall off the 
canyon into the wildebeest and die terribly. Somebody posted that clip on Twitter just as a comparison. And because they spent all this money to make the lions look as real as possible, they're like, oh, so we're going to make them behave like actual lions would. So that entire scene is Scar bopping Mufasa on the nose like cats bop each other when they fight. Right. And then he falls. And it looks terrible. It takes all the dramatic tension out of the movie because it's just filmed in daylight. And when you have animated expressive lions, the audience is like, okay, I buy these are lions. It's a cartoon, so this is how lions look in this cartoon world. And you can give them human expression yeah. and a full range of emotion. Oh, no. I'm sorry. The Lance Strider died. No. But yes, you, you continue. But I, this goes on with what you're saying with the puppets. They made these Land Striders because they're like, oh, we can put people on stilts like this. Right. And then they built the creature around that. When you are have a pre-established story and then you're changing how things can be expressive in the movie, it's going to be bad. It's going to look terrible. Well, it's also just like the real lesson of that is that visual logic always trumps you know, the logic of slavish realism, you know? By the way, I just have to pause because this is my favorite line uh, where if you're not watching it with us, Kira just saved both of them by jumping off a cliff. He says, and then because, you know, he's the only Gelfling and he's never met another one, uh, Jen says, wings, I don't have wings. And then Kira goes, of course not, you're a boy. What an amazing line. (laughs) That's that's really like incredible. Technically it doesn't, well, maybe it makes sense. I mean, you could maybe say that, like, okay, how does she know that boys don't have wings if she's never met another one? Um, but definitely it would make sense that Jen doesn't know, like, girl parts, right? Yeah. Because, like, he's, ra- he's raised by eunuchs or something. <laughs> um, and they're just... They're maybe just the, and, yeah, maybe that was something that the podlings happened to know about the geeflings that the prophets didn't yeah. bother to mention or didn't know. I mean, look how many podlings they are. Yeah. there are. Listen, podlings, I, there's sla- some thick. That's what I'm saying. That's what we should call our listeners, podlings. We listen to our podcast. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, I, I, I'm not okay with that. You're going to have to leave. Vote in the comments below whether you think we should call you podlings from now on. I <laughs> just know that I won't care. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, it is, that line is just fantastic, right? Like, it, it's just great. You know, the weird, like, this, like, sp- I guess it is sort of making a spectacle of the female body in a way, but it's not at all like, it's not at all like in a way that is It's like not sexual at all. No, but it's like, it's interesting because of that, because it is not sexualized and it's not something that like circumscribes them in a specific role. It's just like specifically something about her body that is female 100% enables them to progress further. Yeah. And it's very like interesting, and also just it's it's perfectly written. Honestly, it's just perfectly expressed. It's it's very simple, but it's and we don't beautiful. get the line of dialogue afterwards. It's just like, well, yeah, because long ago the goddess blessed. Oh God, yeah, the female ones with wings, and then the men can do this. Slam my face against the wall. <laughs> no, it's just like okay, that's the thing we know now. Yeah, cool. Moving on. Yeah, it's 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 beautiful in its simplicity. Um, but I was interrupting something that we were talking about. Oh, well, I guess we were just Lion King, right? Visual logic will always trump the logic of realism. And that's why you can tell whether or not something is nitpicking by trying to look at what the movie is trying to do with its own logic. If the movie is saying something with its own logic, right, and it's successful and it works well, if somebody nitpicks it because it's not reality, it's like, listen, I understand what you're saying, but actually your point is invalid, Because you're not watching the movie. This is why Neil deGrasse Tyson is just a stupid idiot. (laughs) That's not what that's like in space. Blah, 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 blah. You know, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You're watching a story. Yeah, it's like I remember when uh, Interstellar came out. He was like, oh, well, they say that they're this far away from Earth. But actually, that would put you just past Jupiter. Fuck you. It's for the purpose of the, like... I'm not going to be like, oh, where would they actually be? They're they're billions of miles away from Earth. Yes. And I think always when you have like really hardcore nerds, it's yeah. like you 
you you are the nerds that seem like not fun to engage with at all because you take this movie that is trying to be a movie and you make it 100% about how you know better than this movie what it is. But you don't know better is the thing because yeah. you're not actually watching it. You're not paying attention to like the logic and you don't actually accept that the visual logic of this movie is superior to the logic of the real world. Uh, even if it is a movie that has a realist or naturalistic aesthetic, you know, uh, the movie's logic is always more important. And I think I haven't seen the clip you're talking about, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's important that you have your characters be expressive in specific ways. And well, it's not even that if you build your story around them being able to have expressive human emotions, right. And then you tell the same story, but take that away for some reason. It's, inherently you're, you're setting yourself up for it just it it seems a worse movie it's like you can compare it to an idea of somebody who took footage from planet earth and then just did voiceover yeah of like no simba don't go down there Woo! or like i'm score i'm mean I'm and everybody i've talked to about it they're like yeah but they got beyonce and they got john oliver and they got but donald glover mean that doesn't mean anything it's big names to attach to this like ugh. what was beyonce's last movie Gold member? Could be. I don't know. Oh my gosh. Would you I guess people could argue that her like visual album stuff is kind of like a movie. Yeah. Oh, well, it's not a movie though. It's a visual album. It's different. Which is not to say it's, you know, better or worse than movies. I'd rather watch that than watch Spider Man. <laughs> Come at me, Tumblr. I mean, into I don't know, that was just a very specific thing. If I have to watch Spider-Man, watch Into the Spider-Verse, because that, that's animation that was the style contributes to the movie entirely, and it's done great. Also, so. I, I don't think I've ever plugged another podcast, but Joe Dante does a podcast with a screenwriter named Josh Olson who wrote A History of Violence. Okay. Um, and while I don't always agree with a lot of their opinions on movies, which is fine, um, they do this great thing where they invite a lot of Hollywood people to come down and talk about their favorite movies. It's called the movies that made me podcast. Yeah. And they had that director, um, from, or one of the directors from, uh, from, uh, uh spider verse. And, yeah. uh, it was just a joy to listen to him talk about stuff. And he talked about movies that we could totally do on the show. Cause I have them stuff like, um, uh, Oh my God, the Masahiro Shinoda movie. We've about, talked about this about before. the board game, know. but what's it called? Oh my god, I'm gonna go insane! Oh my god, I'm looking at my shelf right now. Where is it, Max? My head is gonna explode okay, like one of these pod links. Okay, talk about the movie. I'm gonna look at this. But oh god, so yeah, we got the weird pale science. flower. Okay, that one, yeah. But you, I, I, I know you won't get around to it for a while, but like, because we're both blown out on superhero movies, but like, just Into the Spider Verse was like. Just so well done. I was People generally. really love that movie, and it seems like the type of movie that is deserving of that. Again, I can't really, I can't really say anything about it other than just, you know, reacting to the reactions I've seen of it in a secondhand way. But you know, it definitely does seem like a worthwhile uh, movie to watch, and definitely what should be done with superheroes. Yeah. Again, it sort is sort of like what you're talking about, where it's like, I superhero movies could so easily get weird in so many different ways, but they are trapped to that, like trying to do it in a sort of realist way, kind of. And you want big name celebrities? Way. We got Nick Cage punching Nazis in that movie. What more could you ask for? Just a documentary about him doing that. Yeah. Hey, are you a Nazi? <laughs> That's Nicholas Cage as part of Antifa. Prove me wrong. Now, what do you think about... I mean... This is just like, I, you know, I really, I know we talked about it yesterday, but really it is surprising the degree to which, like, really Jen just doesn't do anything. Yeah. She, I mean, she does get captured, which is a trope, but then she just immediately gets herself out of the, out of the trouble she's in, right? And Jen is just struck, like stuck under some rocks. I'll get out of these rocks eventually. It really is kind of unfair that Jen gets to, to punch in the crystal. You know, the more I think about it, the more I'm just like, what's Jen's purpose in this movie? <laughs> well, it's not just that. It like kind of makes me annoyed because it's like, really, he doesn't do anything. And you know what? He doesn't ever get a greater awareness of the world he's interacting with, you or, know, or even, I know it's a dumb chosen one trope. Like he has some inherent 
ability, like something to do with playing the flute or whatnot that like really helps them defeat the Skeksis and really justifies him being the one. I mean, we set up the flute thing in a clever way, right? Yeah. Where he finds out which shard is the right shard by doing that. Um, and he sort of un- understands it intuitively based on what he's been taught and yeah. how he's been raised. Have but. to come back. Like there's a bunch of cracks in the crystal after all these years. And by playing the flute, he's the only one who can determine where the crystal gro- yeah, goes at the end. Something like that. Like, or just like s- anything, you know, like he's supposed to, it, and it also, it's just like, it's this weird thing where this movie in doing that, it somehow, I, I, and then again, it, we we talk sort of about the racial politics of this, right? Although <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of amusing, this reaction. Um, but also, it's kind of sad because it's like it is just like you know everything is connected and they can't exist yeah. without one another. Um, but I, you know, I'm just realizing this now, right? But when it does lean into her abilities, and you know, and when you think about the way her abilities are characterized, and her character is characterized as somebody who is more in touch with, like, you know, the world and aware, you know, than than Jen is, it sort of does this weird thing where it's like, it kind of maybe reinforces a slight noble savage attitude about them. Um, although, again, I'm going to talk about this right at the end. Can it's I- more complicated than that. One second. I'm just saying that, like it does this thing where it's like it it seems to forget that math and ge- like geometry and like astronomy are useful skills that also people who are not like industrial evil metal city living weirdos right like the skexies have made use of all, for all the time and something yeah. that are vital to maintaining harmony in your environment and everything right like that's that's an important part of that. It's not it's not like those two things are like mutually exclusive to one another. Like that can the mathematic skills and like the dorkiness that Jen has could be very useful in gaining a better understanding of the world. Yeah, and here's the thing about that. So I'm trying to think of ways that we could make it justified at the end for Jen to be the one to put the crystal in. Let's go back to that line that you loved. The of course you don't have wings. You you're a boy. Okay. Um have that be a subversion because we see they have like the weird evil science lab in the bottom. Right. Have her be a plant. Have that like she was created by the uh, Skeksis to lure him there because they couldn't find the last one and they knew there was still one and he's prophesied to destroy them. Is that a trope? Yes, but this movie's full of tropes. Um, She doesn't have to be aware of it. She doesn't have to like be a secret asshole or something, but like, she was created by them to do that, and she has wings because the Skeksis have vegetal wings as well, so why not? And they don't really know what a gifling looks like anymore. Hmm. I mean, maybe. I don't know. I but think I like more that just the idea of that just being the valid female yeah, body. No, I'm saying, but like, if we're taking what's available in this movie without adding too much else, like that, that's already there, but just like something, because you're right, like he doesn't deserve it at all. It like should have been in just a moment where he's just like, no, you're. I the- mean, you just have to help him do anything. Yeah. Other than at the end when it just doesn't feel earned, you know, like it just at this point it's just a little bit too late. He needed to be doing things this entire time, and it would have helped if he changed a little bit. It's a, um, tribble. It's a tribble. There are a lot of like triple looking things in this. Yeah. But anyway, uh, part of the thing I've been putting off and discussing about like whether or not there's a certain like you know racial politics in this and the post colonial thing is definitely you can pull out post colonial stuff in the treatment of the different species, right? But it, it, at the end of the day, I think it's a little bit more complex than just saying that, like, the Uru are a vision of, like, a noble savage thing because I think, like, in the cosmological, like, understanding of this world, it's almost like... It's almost like a reverse thing. It's almost like... It's not that the race existed first. It's that the trait existed first and then it just expressed itself. Yeah. I don't know, like... I don't know if it's less problematic necessarily, but it's technically it's kind of a reverse thing. So it's a little bit more complicated, but also I think it is interesting how like, okay, look at what they're about to do here. They're like, Oh, you're not going to let us in. Oh, too bad. Garthim. Yeah. We're going to come get you. And I think there's an interesting logic that happens when you really focus on the idea that these two things are connected because it's like, it's not that they are innocent, you know, they're connected and they can't exist without one another, but also one cannot be evil without the other one. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's like a weird shared responsibility. Like somehow they are also culpable because they are the same. And the Skeksis could only be as evil as they are if the Uru are so like reclusive and slow moving as they are, you know? It's kind of interesting. So there is definitely a sort of shared responsibility for that and, and, and how like, you know, both, both are required to restore harmony. You know, you can't, you cannot be an Uru and expect the world to be okay. Just in the same way that you obviously can't be a Skeksis, you know? I mean, yeah. literally, what did we just see them do? So they, they can manipulate and control the Gar theme? Yeah, so... So what, they could the have prevented other, yeah. genocide. But they, they could didn't. have prevented genocide, but they didn't do anything. But they did save one that they found. <laughs> they felt they should do something about that. Yeah, I mean, it is kind of like... It is kind of strange. And then also... I, I know we just said earlier that you really can't trust the Chamberlain because the Skeksis are evil at their core, right? Yeah. That's a fundamental truth about this world. But it is interesting because it's like, okay, so he expresses this opinion that actually the idea of restoring the crystal and merging is something that they, were, they would be open to. You know what I mean? Or at least like he could convince them that it would be good for them. Yes, because they want the crystal to be restored or something, right? Now they may not understand truly that you know, the rest restoration of the crystal is both, you know, the, something that restores their power, but also destroys them yeah. because they become, they're subsumed into higher beings. But it's like, it, it is interesting because it's like, oh, so there's, it, it's even less like simplistic, the, their antagonism than you thought. Like we agree that he's probably lying because he's evil to his core. And he wants to be in power. And yes. He sees that as a way to get his power that he was obviously wrongfully denied there. But let's go with the hypothetical. Yeah. What if they do go there, okay, and they do, okay, in this movie, they kill both Kira and Jen, and they finally have the crystal shard, and they put it in, and now they're the same. It's the same ending. Yeah. You know? So I think it is like this thing where it's like, weirdly, they both want the same thing, which is the restoration of the crystal. It's just in completely different ways. It's it the the way that this movie just focuses on the idea of creating the link between these two, between the dichotomy, right? Between the black and the white morality. It's it's really not super complicated, but it results in a lot of interesting implications because it manages to actually focus on that throughout the entire movie. It doesn't do it at the beginning and then forget about it and then do it at the end. It continually does it. And because of that, it leads you with all these interesting questions that you can ask about like the way this universe is ordered. And uh, it, it really does not allow you to put everything into a box in that very neat way. I think you, I mean, I haven't really watched the Lord of the Rings movies recently with this view in mind, but like you could definitely more easily watch Lord of the Rings and perhaps find potentially problematic or unsettling, you know, racial implications in those movies from like any sort of post-colonial view, because it's like those, the orcs, the Uruka, you know, like they're all just evil 100%. And the movie is okay with that homogenous view of evil. Yeah. You know, again, that's not necessarily something that is a, a super failure of the moving movie. And I haven't really watched it with that in mind, but it's like, it's definitely trying to be that simple well, there's, story. There's a reason that like nowadays, whenever there's just like generic CGI evil things that exist to be killed, they're called orcs for the most part. Like they, they do exist to be evil. And there is like some reading of Tolkien's books. Cause a lot of it is reminiscent of world war one and world war two, but of just like, Oh, if this represents this, that's slightly problematic. But like a lot of it is like in pre industrial revolution, England versus post industrial revolution, England. And just like, how have we lost our soul? And like, will the machines now do it? Yeah. I mean, I guess my point overall is that when you have genre fiction, and more specifically fantasy fiction, I think is the easiest for this to happen. You have now a license to just magic into existence 
without really having to justify it as much, the creation of all these different races. And it's very easy for people to just create an evil race, right? Like yeah. orcs. And then you can just be like, okay, they only exist to be evil. And then the original, and that's the whole purpose. Well, yeah, the original Tolkien thing, they were, uh, the orcs, not the uruk uh, were elves that Morgoth and Sauron had captured and right. tortured and they, they so much. They turned, and, they turned and, yeah. so much against their nature that they were now basically new things. Right. But I'm saying, like, in, in the genre at large, it's like, okay, we have the ability now. Oh, no, she's going to die. Oh, she's going to get stabbed. But, yes, yeah, so in fantasy, you do have the ability to do that. And without any, like, introspection or thought about why you're doing that, it can become, you know, unsettling and problematic. And it's something yeah. that's worth looking at. But, again, I think it's interesting how this movie totally is not interested in telling that story, you know? Um, it is not interested in showing any any sort of idea of evil as being discreet from any idea of good. In fact, it would even suggest that, uh, you know, the idea of evil and good cannot coexist without one another because they yeah. have nothing to differentiate themselves against, you know? So just taking that approach to it really goes far in, in making it a more interesting story. And I think despite the fact that this movie you know, is not necessarily the best movie in terms of like every scene and its character construction. I think really that focus on structuring the world in that way with the interconnectedness and the refusal to make good and bad separate from one another, that is really why this movie I think is definitely timeless. I think people are going to watch this movie forever and they're going to love it forever because it's like, you know, it, it, it's obviously like incredible artistry in animating these puppets and everything. Yeah. But it's like the focus on that story makes it so strong, you know, and it feels so accessible that it, it, it's definitely, that's, that's its greatest strength for me. Sorry for the first time now, I'm like really thinking of just like, because I, I remember watching this and just thinking like now Chamberlain's obviously trying to manipulate them for his own gains. But now I'm just caught up on the idea of just like, what if he generally did want there to be peace? Well, that's the thing is because even, okay, even if, even if he was still trying to manipulate him, right? This is the point I tried to make earlier, but didn't really do it as clearly. Yeah. Like the fact that it occurs to him to offer that as an explanation to lure them is interesting. Yeah. Like, oh, they'll know that if I say that, oh, we want to restore the shard, that they'll find that convincing. But why? Because he assumes they think that's exactly what they think that the Skeksis will want to do. Yeah. So there is some sort of assumption that like, oh, they want this to happen. It's just a difference in implications in the manner in which it happens or maybe their understanding of what happens when, they res when it results, right? Like many prophecy movies, you know, the thing exact happens exactly how it's been said to happen, but it's like a monkey's paw, genie wish yeah. thing, right? Where, you know, it's it somehow is nothing like what you imagined to at be, the beginning. To use a very stupid example, in the Star Wars prequels, there's the very vague prophecy that Anakin Skywalker will bring balance to the Force, which technically he does by the end of the prequels because there are two Jedi and two Sith left alive. So, Honestly, those movies are too stupid for me to actually buy that that's actually what it's doing. I think that's a retcon. Really? I think that's the stupidest fucking possible resolution of that. I just don't believe there's any sort of subtext in those mm -hmm. movies. I think the subtext of those movies is how poorly George Lucas writes romantic dialogue. <laughs> the subtext of those movies is, is just his That's romantic a, life disappearing. <laughs> he brings all, well, all his dates to that restaurant he got salad with David Lynch at. David Lynch said, oh, no, I don't want to direct your stupid movie about elves in the woods or whatever. I'm going to direct my dumb movie about, about worms and worms. spice. Yeah, and... Kyle McLaughlin <laughs> with a thing in his nose. And Sting. Patrick Stewart. And love play. That was his phrase he had, right? <laughs> what do you think about these characters? They're called Ursex, I think. Or Urskex? Yeah, well, it's combined into yeah. both. It's the good and the evil combined into one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sorry. 
I've seen a meme of that picture. It's, it's like when your girlfriend's passed out and you still stoned as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I think it's interesting because it's like, it, it, it's like there's, I don't know what to make of like the true union and what results from them now. Obviously they bring back Kira, right? But like, yeah. I think that's maybe another problem. Well, this movie's not even willing to kill the dog. They're not going to kill the female lead. Like, right. But I mean, like, okay, let's let's sort of look at another thing that we could maybe nitpick this movie for. I think if you're talking about the interconnectedness of the world, you get lots of evidence about how the Skeksis have ravaged this world. But also you get lots of evidence to the contrary, and you don't really see the ravaging happen in real time unless it's against the podlings or, you know, Agra's workshop area or, you know, just the landscape around the, the tower, right? And it's like, it would be interesting to see it in, in the world, literally. Like, we see the ruins. That's a good example of this. This is probably the closest it gets to what I'm talking about. Yeah. But we never see the, any of those beautiful animals or, like, you know, moving plants that they animate. We never see one, like, fuck up because its genes are now fucked because of the Skeksis. But that's exactly the subtext of this movie. You know, it, it, it should be that the world is decaying because of what's going on. And I feel like, you know, may, it's maybe just missing one scene where we, you know, we set up the spe- spectacle at one point of this beautiful, amazing world. And then we have to show us the pain that it is suffering. I think that's important. And we don't quite get that. Although it still works because, you know, I think the imagery of just the Gar theme like bursting in the way they do is still yeah. disturbing. Also, what's interesting is in the flashback, we see what's clearly a Skeksis figure shattering the crystal. So had they already split themselves by then? I uh, don't know. I, I guess can't. it doesn't matter that much. It's just... Well, they use the power of it and then they split it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so I think that would improve the movie a bit. But again, the, but still, the imagery of the Gar theme is pretty effective. As you said, this is, it's not a perfect movie, but God, it is, is it great? But as, it is 100% the Dark Crystal. Yes. And, you know, I know there's a lot of, um, we haven't really talked a lot about the behind the scenes stuff in this movie, but you could do a whole other commentary track, obviously just discussing that stuff, because, I mean, this movie is, like we said, maybe the most ambitious movie we've covered on this show so far. I'm trying to think of other ones we've done. Um, I have a terrible memory for this, but like, yeah. really, what are the other things you could really compare this to that we've done? Is, has, is anything even close to this ambitious? Hmm. I would say in a weird way, tank girl, but that's based on a source material. So even that's a little bit diminished. Um, I mean, specifically in the sense of like production value, what is the closest one we've done? Hmm. I don't know. We don't do like, that's not really our forte. It's just like, right. So I don't know. We, you're right. I don't think we've ever done. I think maybe the closest one we've done is starship troopers to a degree. Yeah. But. Um, and then just given the scale of like what they had to do with computer animation in 1997 is pretty insane with all those bugs and shit, you know, like that's pretty intense to be able to do that. Right. And, and have all those effects and like, cause that's not taking the Jurassic park approach, but it still works really well where it's like, no, the bugs are front and center in that movie for a long, long portion of that movie. But, uh, you know, they still work pretty well. But I think that might be the closest one. I'm sure somebody is screaming at us for some movie we we have idiotically forgotten that we've done. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so I, I, I'm I glad we did this movie, although I feel like there's still things about it that sort of, um, I don't know, escape me, which yeah, I like, too. But I, I feel, it's just so well-structured and organized. It's one of those movies I just kind of feel refreshed and nice after watching it's just like oh yeah one yeah wonderful art still exists and it may not be perfect in its narrative but god if it isn't perfect in its application of practical effects and katharina kubrick hmm. assistant art director is that the name of i think no it's vivian this is his daughter anyway that doesn't matter um so yeah this has been Dark Crystal. I'm glad we did it again. Of course, I think the person who did mime training is named Jean-Pierre Emil. <laughs> well, they're all French at this time. Yeah. Or they just thought the French were all good mimes. mimes. Yeah. <laughs> they just hired a random French person. <laughs> You're a mime, right? But yes. Yeah, so, um, oh, 
I'm going to talk to you about a William Castle movie later. That kind of okay. But anyway, this has but been yeah. the Spectator Film Podcast. Um, you so can, yeah, maybe maybe we'll revisit this movie at some point. I'd, I'd like lo- to. Maybe. I would love to. I will watch this as many times. I'm yeah. Really so, glad I rediscovered this. So yeah. Um, so thank you. Hopefully Austin. everybody is is excited to watch this movie again anyway just because of the new show coming out you're like oh it's time to revisit this movie definitely do it um obviously we don't know how good the show is but they're committed to doing it with puppets so maybe that'll be interesting as well either way this is definitely something that um feels unique to me in film and i'm I'm glad we talked about it so yeah this has been the spectator film podcast you can find us at spectatorfilmpodcast.com or on spotify itunes or stitcher and that's it unless you have something else to say max Mm. I approve. <laughs> <laughs>